up to you. All righty, let me share my screen. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction, Anita. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Laura Fuller. I go by she, her pronouns, and I want to thank you to everyone who's joining us today. So during today's presentation, I will be using the terms parents and caregivers interchangeably. I know that today, especially families come in all shapes and sizes and compositions. So I don't want anyone to feel that this presentation and the material being discussed is not applicable to them. So regardless of your title, if you are responsible for helping a middle schooler with their homework, you are in the right place. Also, I know there will be time for questions at the end. However, if someone has a very pressing question during the presentation, don't hesitate to stop me and ask. So homework, the facts. So there is actually such a thing as too much homework, and it's actually listed as one of the top stressors for middle school students. Because of this being such a big stressor, stressor this can actually lead to a variety of adverse effects, both for physical, mental, and emotional health, and it can lead to increased anxiety. Um, because of the imbalance, um, if there's apologize if there's too much of an imbalance on homework versus um, other tasks that the students are responsible for. Um, it can lead to increased anxiety. Ac according to the National Education Association and National Parent Teacher Association, it suggested that students have about 10 minutes of homework per grade level. So if you have a first grade student, it should be about 10 minutes, second grade, 20 minutes, sixth grader, about an hour, Per night and so on. Um, and actually research has shown that if students have more than one to two hours of homework a night, it actually negates all the benefits and all the reasons why homework is encouraged and implemented in the first place. So what are some of those reasons as to why homework is important? So homework helps to reinforce classroom learning and improve student achievement performance. It provides practice how do people learn and increase their proficiency at something by practicing? Whether it's learning math problems, learning the periodic or table, uh, reviewing the process of photosynthesis. When academic material is reviewed over and over again, it increases the likelihood that it's actually going to be internalized by the student and understood rather than as we have all heard cram sessions where it's pure rote memorization. You remember it for as long as you need it and quickly forget it right afterwards. It also helps to increase self-discipline. So self-discipline is an important skill, not only in the classroom, but also later on in life. This will translate into one's um, work ethic once they enter into the workforce. Um, and even in nurturing and developing important areas of interest, you know, if you're trying to learn a new language or learn a musical instrument, you need that self-discipline to practice and rehearse on a set schedule so you improve your skills. It also helps to promote the learning of healthy study habits and life skills. Um, so these are skills that are useful not only in the classroom, but also later on in life when you get older and you're learning how to juggle school, a job, extracurriculars, or even later on in life, if you decide to have a family and having to juggle their schedules in addition to yours. Um, the homework, you know, it helps you learn how to do problem solving, time management, and increase your organizational skills. So most importantly though, it, in oh, I'm sorry, I already discussed that point. Most important, it encourages the family to be a part of the student's learning. So there is a common misconception that once children are older and enter about the middle school age that, you know, the homework is their responsibility. They're old enough, they should know better, it's their job. So while on one hand this is true and middle school is a great time to help increase that accountability and responsibility for the students on their daily homework assignments, it's actually one of the most important times where parents need to be involved too. So this is the first time that kids are encountering these new experiences, having to learn these skills. Um, you know, how did we come to learn these? By 
someone teaching us and by someone practicing with us. Um, so in this you know, whole middle school world of unknowns, it's incredibly helpful for uh, parents to help guide their children and teach them these skills. They, you know, the children are still developing, as we have heard over and over again, children's brains don't fully develop until they're 25. So I believe it's a little bit of a reach to ask a 11 or 12 year old to be solely responsible for their education. So I'm sure some people go into, you know, middle school thinking, well, my child was great with their homework in elementary school. What has changed? Well, I will tell you a lot. Um, so they have more teachers. Typically kids in middle school are switching their classes for most subjects. So that means teacher students are having to deal with anywhere from six to seven teachers on a daily basis, having to navigate the different personalities, their different student teacher relationships and teaching styles. And that can be very overwhelming. Additionally, the building in the campus itself is significantly larger. A lot of cities have it structured where, you know, there's several small elementary schools and then they all funnel into one larger middle school. This is a huge adjustment in terms of not only the space, but having to navigate the building and even just for some, the sheer increased volume of kids that are around them at any given time. They have new academic expectations. The work is getting harder as it should as they get older. Additionally, students are now starting to earn a GPA. There are academic clubs and sometimes students start to see there be an academic divide between different groups of students. Additionally, students are expected to take notes and they are getting more complex and long-term assignments and group projects. In order to be able to manage these different tasks, it takes students um, time to increase their skill set and improve their executive functioning on how to navigate all these new challenges. And then a large change for most students is the new social pressures and expectations. With all of the elementary schools funneling together and maybe new students in general coming from different school districts, you know, children are starting to try to figure out where they fit into the picture. Who are their friends? What's their identity? They start trying on, you know, different identities to see what fits them. Um, so, you know, they're navigating friendships, they're navigating potential cliques that might happen. And there's always the potential for bullies as well. And the obvious, physical and mental changes, aka puberty, as if, you know, all the aforementioned things aren't enough that they're dealing with. They have a ton of different internal changes they're trying to manage, increase self-awareness, and worry about how they're being perceived by others. So I don't know about anyone else listening, but looking at all these factors, it's not a surprise to me that homework is not necessarily at the very top of their priority list. So what gets in the way of kids doing their homework? We're going to talk about um, each of these factors individually in the upcoming slides. Um, but some of them, you know, low self-esteem, not feeling it's worthwhile, ineffective communication, lack of a routine, inconsistent expectations, lack of consequences, and the list goes on and on. So let's get started on talking about some of these different drivers. Low self-esteem. So for one, does your child feel that they're even capable of completing the work that's in front of them? Do they feel confident in their skills? If the child is doubting their skill set, it often makes them a lot more reluctant to want to try the work as they might feel dumb or feel like they're a failure if they can't get the answers correct. So rather than trying and potentially coming off as a failure, it's a lot easier to avoid the work. And as we talked about just a little bit before, this coincides with all the changes they're experiencing internally about themselves, their high increase, heightened increase of self-awareness and feeling that you know they're constantly being watched by others and being judged in their every movement. Not understanding its purpose. So, does your child understand why the homework is important? I'm sure we've heard and even probably said ourselves many times, when am I ever going to use, insert your least favorite topic ever in life? Um, while maybe the statement is true, maybe it's not, um, it also pays an attitude and can foster a mindset that only some learning is worthwhile and we're putting that kind of energy effort into. Um, additionally, if a student never believes this information again, it could potentially you know, push aside a future career for them or a passion. You know, this is uh, been the experience of many famous people. You know, Walt Disney, for example, was told that he lacked imagination and didn't have any good ideas. So it meant if he decided to push all of that aside, we wouldn't have half of the attractions and experiences that there are today for children. Um, so tell that also to his, you know, one billion dollars in net worth of his estate. Or Albert Einstein, who reportedly didn't speak until he was four years old or read until he was seven. Imagine that if he just decided to give up on his 
education. And then there was um, scientist Charles Darwin. He didn't initially want to become a scientist, but after some less than positive comments made by his father, it helped to encourage him to apply himself. And then lastly, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, he was not always a math whiz um, and it wasn't always his passion, but once he started into his college education over at Cambridge, he realized that it was his life calling. So sometimes by pursuing areas that we think are not necessarily our strengths, they can actually turn out to make the biggest impacts in our lives and in you know, some of the world's discoveries. Ineffective communication. This is often seen between the school, the student, and the caregiver. You know, as caregivers, we always want to trust and believe that our student is sharing the exact details of what's going on. However, as we know, for a variety of reasons, this might not always be the case. I try to live by and encourage the motto of trust, but verify. If your child says they don't have any homework, what does their Google Classroom say? If they say that they're up to date on their assignments, a quick email to the teacher or checking the parent portal can confirm this claim. Yes, there will probably be the child that says, what, you don't believe me? You don't trust me? In those times, it is encouraged to be prepared with response along the lines of, I trust you, but I want to see for myself. I'm curious what you're learning about. And not only um, not making the children feel untrustworthy or that they're to blame, but it shows that you have an interest in what they're doing. And it also helps to increase parental accountability in their education. Lack of the inner routine. So it can be incredibly difficult to get a child to homework if there isn't a routine, if there's never been one, and you know, the parents and the doctor sure what their after school look like. Despite what some may say, people thrive on structure. Humans are creatures of habit, and there is a great sense of comfort in knowing exactly what to expect. Yeah, there are some individuals that are more comfortable with a constantly changing and flexible schedule, but usually that's not until later in life after they have developed a variety of skills in order to allow them to be that flexible and adaptable. Children like routines and structure, even when they fight against it. And most of the time, they actually really crave it. It means that a trusted adult is taking time to think about them, their needs, and trying to create an ideal environment for them to thrive in. Inconsistent or unclear expectations. Does your child know that you expect them to do their homework? I know this sounds like a silly question, but if no one ever explicitly says that, how would someone know unless they're taught? Um, if, if they do know they need to do their homework, do they know if it's on a daily basis? Is it once a week? Is it whenever they get around to it? Children often claim that they didn't know, and this might be true. As adults, what's common sense to us is only common sense to us as the result of our lived and learned experiences. How do you know that you should complete homework? From our caregivers, teachers, a trusted adult helping to instill that message, and then additionally having a routine, and knowing exactly the requirements over and over again will help children be able to know exactly what is expected of them. You know, like our little Dilbert com uh, comic says, how are you doing on your unspoken objectives? My what? I'm referring to the goals I have in my mind that I've never mentioned. How are you doing on those? I'm totally nailing them. So once again, Dilbert can't read his boss's mind. Children can't read our mind. They can't read the teacher's mind. Lack of meaningful consequences or incentive. It is super easy to jump consequences with kids. If you don't do what you're told, privileges are quickly taken away. No going out, no TV, no phone, no video games. There are always a lot of no's told. However, what about thinking about it in the opposite terms? We're incentivizing homework completion. Now, we out, people often hear the word incentivizing and immediately switch to making it a bribe. However, let's rephrase this thought. So, children are often told that school is their full time job. As adults, when we go to work, we generally expect to be compensated for work, right? So, why should it be any different for kids? I'm not saying necessarily that we have to pay them an hourly wage, but if there's something which will help motivate them and demonstrate our appreciation for their work and efforts, what's wrong about that? The biggest thing is learning if your child is motivated by consequences or rewards and then adjusting your strategy accordingly. This is something that we will touch on a little later. Subject matter difficulties. So this is especially applicable to kids that might have an individualized education program, an IEP, uh, especially those that have a specified learning disability. Having additional needs and supports in a particular subject isn't an excuse, but it does remind us as adults why a student might be avoiding their work. Low caregiver interest. Why is it important? It's not your homework, right? It's theirs. 
However, children watch and observe adults' reactions to different things to help them gauge whether something is worth focusing on. If they see that their own parent isn't interested, it will make it increasingly difficult to convince them that their homework is something important and worth caring about. Mental health concerns. If your student is experiencing mental health concerns such as anxiety, depression, most likely the last thing on their mind is going to be their schoolwork. Imagine trying to run a marathon with an additional 50 pounds strapped to your back that you never pre prepared for. Is that going to slow you down? Is it going to make it hard to finish the race? Well, if your answer is yes, this is exactly the same as if someone is struggling with a mental health diagnosis. Especially if these mental health concerns are being treated through therapy, medication, or whatever other treatment option, it makes daily tasks and functioning highly difficult to overcome. Organizational challenges. I mentioned this a little earlier, but students now have six classes, six to seven different years, do knows which are many assignments at the beginning of the hour, taking notes, group projects, midterms, finals, makeup work, NWEA testing, PSATs in the eighth grade, I believe they have. The list goes on and on and on about the numerous responsibilities middle school students are suddenly thrown into when they walk through those large double doors. If a student is unable to stay on top of the information with the work being assigned to them, how in the world are they ever gonna be able to complete it? Later on, we are going to address some strategies on how to help your child remain organized during this big change in their lives. This also ties in with the student's perception of if they're able to complete everything. A lot of children feel that they don't have enough time. While us as adults could probably easily point out, well, you have the time after school, the time before bed, the time before you go to your sports events. Um, that's not something always easily noticeable by the child. So we have to help teach them those organization and critical thinking skills so they're able to identify those time periods. Social relationships and perceptions. Um, as we discussed a little earlier, kids at this age are starting to care more about what their peers think and how they're perceived by others and tend to worry less about their parents' opinion of them. In turn, the peer group that your child hangs out with may have a strong influence on whether they do or do not complete their homework. So if your child tends to hang around with a group of kids that are higher achievers or very focused on their academics and really want to go somewhere, after middle school and high school, there's a higher chance that your student will also follow suit. However, if your student tends to hang around with other peers that don't complete their homework or don't care about you know, their GPA or passing a class, there's a high chance that your student will follow suit and not wanna do their work as well. Developmental changes. So looking at their since developmental changes, during the middle school time frame, students are between two states of industry versus inferiority and identity versus role confusion. In the first stage of industry inferiority, children are learning about important social and emotional skills and seeing if they fit their own abilities to perform certain tasks and how to handle themselves in different situations. Parents need to help support and encourage children as they navigate through the stage, and the children start to learn how to make some independent decisions. If a child feels that they have a sense of industry, they feel they're capable and competent in their skills. This easily translates in uh, needing to support the student in their education and helping them through difficult learning tasks. During identity versus role confusion, this is when children start to shift their focus to more social and peer relationships. Um, at this stage, they're starting to face more peer pressure. They're also worried about their ability to fit in and make friends. And as I just mentioned earlier, uh, depending on the friends that your child associates with might have a strong correlation to the choices that they make. So the good stuff, the meat of why probably most people are here. How to get students to complete their homework. These are just a few of the different ways that I thought of. Um, it's all about being creative. I will start with that. So for one, do homework with them. Kids often feel like they are the only ones with responsibility, despite us adults lecturing that we have to go to work and clean the house. If they feel like they're the only ones stuck inside doing a task and missing out on all the fun, it's a lot harder to convince them that it needs to be done. So how about switching it up and sit down with your student and work with them? Maybe you're taking a class uh, for your job or something that you're interested in, and you can do your homework alongside them. No actual work. What about um, daily tasks like balancing a checkbook, checking your finances, studying for a continuing education exam, or what about planning out your week, um, or even taking time to learn about something you yourself are interested in, like a foreign language, 
a new subject, an instrument. Um, regardless of what your choice is, it's all about helping to foster a sense of camaraderie with your student and then you also are to model those in skill about diligence and uh, work completion. Figuring out what motivates your child. Every single child is different. As we talked about just a little bit before, there are the options of consequences of words, which is most meaningful to your child. So for one, it's consequences. You can get pretty creative. Yes, there are the obvious ones that are like cell phones, video games, being grounded. But for some kids, they don't care. You can play the phone for a month. They don't care at all. So sometimes you have to get quick outside the box. What about taking away a favorite piece of clothing? What about a very favorite pair of shoes or taking away makeup until their homework is completed? Um, once in my prior position, I worked with a student where if she didn't do her homework, she did not get her makeup the next morning for school. Let me tell you, she was very unhappy in the morning she had not earned her makeup. So it seems silly, but it actually can be a really motivating factor. You have to see and pay attention what is meaningful to your child. Um, if it's rewards that are motivating, ask for their input. Um, now, not asking for everyone or encouraging everyone to say, if you do your homework, you're gonna get the newest VR headset or PlayStation 5. Um, it's about finding something that they wanna actually work towards. So if it is something larger, there are different ways you can break it down and help to consistently give them the opportunity to earn towards that reward. And it's also important if there's a plan to work towards something that once a student has earned part towards their larger goal, that that's not taken away. We don't want to reward them and then negatively reinforce by taking that away later on. So an example of this, say your child wants to go to the movies with a friend in two weeks and their goal is to earn $20 to get a ticket and snacks which probably still isn't enough these days, but it's a start. So you tell them that over the next 10 school days, they can earn $2 towards their outing for each day they complete their homework. So over the next two weeks, if they do their homework on only seven out of the 10 days, that means that they've earned $14 towards their movie outing. Um, in this case, they're not penalized for the three days that they didn't do the work. There's the 20 crowd. Whatever works for their learning style and helps them feel like they've actually accomplished something and reached their goal. A homework contract. Um, this helps to show clear expectations and responsibility for not only the child, but also what the parent is going to do on their end. Because as we discussed, Homework is not just the child's responsibility, it's the parents as well. And I'll show an example of a homework contract on um, a future slide. Taking an interest in the subject matter. Ask your child to explain the different steps to you. Um, science shows that in reciting information aloud helps with memory retention. So not only are you helping your student learn, but you might learn something new too, or something that you forgot about. Sometimes thinking back to the TV show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? I know I definitely have forgotten some of those facts, so I think it would be very helpful to have someone remind me of those information. Um, this also, by having a student give you information and teach you, it also helps to increase their self-confidence and help them feel knowledgeable and more comfortable with the subject. Organization. Sometimes half the battle, or sometimes maybe even most of the battle, can be trying to gather together all the assignments that are do and find their due dates in one place and put them together so you even know where to start. So some obvious tips are to get a planner. You can either use a paper one, you can do electronic, whatever works best, um, and write down due dates for the different assignments. Make it a routine for when your child comes home, you go through the book bag together, discuss what are all the papers slash homework you find floating around in there. Get a folder for each subject, label it, or get one of those large accordion folders then have a pocket labeled and dedicated to each class. Another way is maybe set reminders on the kid's phone or an alarm to remind them to do different assignments or study times. Another um, common problem I see is complete work actually getting back to school. The way you can handle this is um, have a folder with side labels, you know, work to turn in or you know, save health and students at homework. Once they completed at home, maybe stand it on your phone or scan it into your computer if you have access to scanner. And that way, if it gets lost, you can easily reprint it out or email it to your or email it to the teacher. Then my distractions. So there's the obvious moving phone, tablet, iPad, and after electronic devices that are not conducive to a work environment or any 
object in general that is highly disturbed student. Um, so keep in mind, this doesn't mean that student has to sit and work. A lot of individuals actually better having background noise or music. So for a kid who says that they want to listen to music, there are other ways that do not entail learning on their phone. There's good old radio. There's Alexa, Google, stream some music from their phone, but keep the phone in a different part of the house. Other distractions to account for might be lots of links or pets. You want to find a space where the kids feel relaxed and comfortable, but also where they have the ability to concentrate. If your child tends to get easily distracted, it might be best to have them complete their work in a common place in the house where people are walking by and they're able to, at a glance, just see if the student is still on task. This is much preferable to uh, a child working in their bedroom with the door closed where they could easily take a nap, which I know I definitely fell asleep many a time doing my homework and my mom would come in at midnight and find me asleep on top of all my books. So lesson learned. So um, as I mentioned earlier, this is just a basic example of a homework contract. This doesn't necessarily have to be super detailed. The most important parts of all this is outlining the clear expectations and responsibility of the students, the parents, and any other outside supports who will be having an active role in the homework completion. Also, this is a great place to outline any rewards or consequences that are associated with the homework. So while there are a lot of great strategies you can implement, there are also a few key areas you want to try to avoid. Making idle or unrealistic threats. So how many times have you said to your child, um, if you don't do your homework or if you're not home on time, you're gonna be grounded for a month, for a year, till you turn 18 years old. Um, I'm not sure what uh, the statements for sure would have about three or four years, but yeah, you're 18, so I still would be good as an adult. Um, so what ask yourself is, this punishment that you have is it reasonable? Is it something that you can actually get to? Or something that you say merely to, you know, kind of shock the child or just a moment of reactiveness, um, and then you give in a day later? If it's more the latter, where you just tend to give in, you know, soon after implementing the consequences, it's not worth making those comments because soon your child will catch on, even from an early age, um, that you don't stick to your word and that eventually you give in. Consistency is the key at all time periods and at all ages for children. Scare tactics. Um, so when I was in my last position working with families whose students were in middle school and high school, um, most of them were on juvenile probation. So often I would hear parents say uh, when their children weren't listening to them, such as about homework, parents were very quick to jump to the line of, I'm calling your probation officer and they're going to violate you which um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, violation of probation means that kids have to go back to court. There's a potential for them to go to the juvenile detention center downtown. However, when parents would call their probation officers, 99.9% .9 of the time, the probation officers wouldn't violate them. They said, this is the parent's responsibility and the parent's problem. Um, so yeah, they weren't gonna remove them from the home and detain them. While well, parents use this as a scare tactic, in turn, it actually takes away their power as a parental figure and they place it onto someone else. They tried to place it onto the probation officers or the courts. So once again, this is just another example showing that um, you as the parent won't follow through with your intended consequence. Inadvertent or inadvertent emotional harm. Um, so sometimes we make statements that are meant to be encouraging, but actually can convey the opposite message. So statements like, you don't want to end up working at McDonald's, do you? Or if you don't complete your work, you'll never get anywhere. Or do you want to be like Aunt Susie who dropped out of school? Once again, this is a very good intent, um, but poor execution. Also, doesn't um, I can't talk. Um, so these statements, they come out of these of care and concern, but that is not always what comes across to the students. Hearing, you know, a student hears a statement, do you want to work at McDonald's? Maybe not at a dream, and that is okay. However, by saying that statement in response to the current situation, it's insulting to them and to their country. Or if you don't complete your homework, you'll never get anywhere. I'm sure we've all heard the term selective listening. Kids often overlook the intent of the statement and only hear select phrases. So in this case, more than likely, the only phrase that they're gonna hear is you'll never get anywhere. That ultimately is only beating them down from the start and making them think there's no point in doing the work anyways. They're not gonna amount to anything. And then lastly, do you wanna end up like Aunt Susie? This comment actually has a two hit factor to it. 
So one, maybe the child has a great connection with Aunt Susie and it could really upset them to hear her, her spoken about like that. Or maybe they think Aunt Susie turned out okay, even if she didn't complete school. So then that can also lead to the thought of, well, if she turned out fine, I can too. So we always hear the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. It also takes a village to educate them. So while home is a huge source of support for students in their educational journey, it doesn't have to be the only one. So there are a lot of other places and supports that people can turn to. Ask about tutoring in the school. There may be tutoring or study groups that happen on a regular ongoing basis. The National Honor Society through your local high school. A lot of times the students in this organization have to complete a certain number of community service hours each year. So this can be a great resource to turn into. Have the students set up regular meetings with the teacher, whether it's before school, after school, during a lunch break. If it can't be done in person for whatever reason due to transportation barriers, what about setting up a Zoom appointment or a Google Meet? I'm gonna talk about these two together, community centers and libraries. Um, often a lot of organizations will come in to work with these different partners and sometimes they offer ongoing tutoring or after school programs. There's also organizations like Girls Club, which have dedicated hours within their school programming to homework. Reach out to a community college. Maybe if your local community college has a education, early child education department, maybe there's someone in there that's looking for some experience and would be willing to tutor. Or asking an extended family member or family friend for support. Sometimes children are more receptive to assistance from adults that is certainly their parent or their teacher, as sometimes it should be perceived as nagging or having some ulterior motive. Um, and then an additional step to think about is if your child might benefit from special education resources. As we alluded to a little earlier, sometimes it's hard to know whether a child avoiding the work is due to um, one of the many reasons we've discussed or because of having a learning disability or other impairment in the classroom. If you suspect your child needs some additional support within the school setting, I highly encourage you to talk to your school's social worker about if maybe an IEP or a 504 plan or some other special accommodation might be right for your child. And that is the end of my presentation. So I just wanna say thank you for everyone for listening. Um, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? Hi, Laura, uh, there are a couple of questions uh, okay. that you could kind of clarify a little bit. Sure. Um, the difference between incentify and reward uh, to them, they think they're the same. Can you explain just a little bit better to them? Um, so in, I guess it depends on how you frame it. Um, I tend to use incentive and reward interchangeably because either way, it's something that you are actively working towards and you are earning. It's not something that's just being given to you. Okay, uh, the next, thank you. Uh, the next question is, how old do the children need to be before the parents no longer have to check on their homework? If they say they're going to do, if they say it's done, should you take that at face value? I don't think that there's any set age. I think that comes as the result of what your child has shown you previously. So say you know, through the first two years of middle school, sixth and seventh grade, they knew that they're doing work, they're consistently on top of it. Maybe then when you go to their eighth grade year, maybe you left and went to say, come here and teacher conference time. If you're hearing reports that, yeah, you know, your student isn't doing the work like they were previously, you already have the built-in skill set to be able to back and you know what you need to do to help your student get back on track. So a lot of it helping to build upon that trust and maturity level of your student. So unfortunately, I wish there was like an exact cutoff age, but there isn't. I mean, there are some parents I've worked with that still need to do this on a daily basis with their high school seniors. Every child's different. <laughs> Okay, thank, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, if there is a, in middle school, as we know, um, children gravitate through different classes. Mm -hmm. And if they're struggling with one class more than the others, is it the child's responsibility to talk to the teacher? Or is it more important for the parent to connect with that teacher? I think that... Um... While it is great if the student is able to self-advocate and say, hey, I need help. Um, as we know, a lot of times students are intimidated because as I mentioned earlier, they're afraid of looking stupid or dumb. 
um, and they don't want to be seen as being less abled. So if your student is able to ask, great. If they say they're going to ask and a couple days have gone by and nothing has come of that, then I think it's a great time for the parents to step in and email them or go with the student um, in person, maybe after school one day. Say, hey, we're going to go talk to Mr. Smith about your, um, your English class and find a better way to get you some support. Okay, and then we have one more question. Um, if both of the children share a room mm -hmm. and generally the routine is that they go in their room and do their homework, but obviously they're two years apart, mm -hmm. um, is it better to still have them in their room together or should the parent find an alternative space for them? I think it depends on how um, the siblings work together, if they're able to keep to themselves and not distract the other, the other one, then sure, let them both, you know, work in the same space. However, if one tends, you know, try to distract or interrupt the other, or if one person has that influence the other sibling to then get all tasks, if that's the case, I would also encourage them some separate learning spaces. Door open or in the class in the bedroom? Open. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> open. Like a second, I cannot tell you the number of times my mom came in and found a sick bed do my homework. Okay, any other questions? Um, or concerns? Well, we would like to thank Laura for her expertise today and uh, thank her for her time this morning as well. This information will be on our website, uh, probably up and running by next week. So check with the Facebook page of the Guidance Center. And it's all up to you, Marley. Thank you for attending today. Um, Anita, it says that I am unable to share my screen with oh, you guys. I'm very sorry. That's okay. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, like Anita said, my name is Marley Brereton, and I'm a prevention specialist with the Guidance Center. Um, I have been working in Downriver Schools, running prevention counseling groups for about the past year now, and I'm also um, a child trauma therapist with the Kids Talk Department. Today, my focus for this pre presentation is on teens and sleep and how it affects their mental health. So as we know, with teenagers, it is a constant battle with what time they're going to bed, when their alarm goes off in the morning, get, getting them out of bed, getting ready for school. This topic has been researched for years and years and years, and it continues to share um, the same, same statistics and outcomes. So for students, are they getting enough sleep? The Center for Disease Control had um, done a national study in 2020, so this was during the year of COVID as well, and this included nine states, and it was found that six out of 10 middle schoolers do not get enough sleep, and seven out of 10 um, high schoolers do not get enough sleep. Children ages 6 to 12 need about 9 to 12 hours of sleep per night, and children ages 13 to 18 need about 8 to 10 hours of sleep per night. So here we can see, provided by the CDC, there are so many children that are not getting enough sleep, and we know there's a lot of factors that go into this. So why are children not getting enough sleep? Teens need about you know, the rage age that I said, the eight to 10 hours of sleep because they're transitioning into adulthood and this brings major changes of emotions, personality factors, social and family life and academics. Encompassing mental health as a whole, it's an umbrella. So there's a lot of trickle down factor into other areas that this affects their lifestyle. So getting enough sleep maintains a teenager's emotional well-being, physical health and their school performance. So like Laura touched on, first of, all, first of all, thinking in academics. Getting enough sleep promotes attention span, memory, and analytical thought. 
So getting enough sleep for teenagers allows them to have um, sharper thinking, helping teenagers to recognize the most important information to consolidate their learning. So like Laura touched on, there are so many things that are going throughout the school day. Having seven, eight classes, getting all this homework assigned to them, being able to consolidate their learning to help them pick out the most important information. Sleep facilitates expansive thinking that can also spur students' creativity. Um, the thinking abilities listed above can help with studying for a test, learning a new instrument, or acquiring job skills. Now for emotional health and well being. As we know, the less sleep that teenagers get, the more cranky they're going to be, irritable. So this can affect mood, causing irritability and exaggerated emotional reactions. So something that may seem minor to us may cause them to, you know, have an exaggerated emotional response. And this can occur, you know, arguments and bickering at home. Prolonged sleep loss can negatively affect emotional development, increasing their risks for interpersonal conflict. So on top of getting less sleep and then being cranky and irritable and causing maybe some issues at home, this also can cause conflict with students at school with their teachers, their counselors, their friends, and other peers. Um, and then this can also lead to a risk for more serious mental health problems the longer um, the sleep loss occurs. So for mental health, Anxiety, depression, and bipolar disorder have been linked to sleep deprivation. This also can lead to an increased risk of suicide attempts. And I'm talking about students that are getting about four to five hours of sleep per night for a long period of time. Improving sleep in adolescents may play a role in preventing mental health disorders or reducing their symptoms in the future. So the less sleep they're, that they are getting, the more likely it is to see, you know, those, those anxious symptoms, those depressive symptoms of low motivation, not completing their homework, having a trouble, having a hard time communicating their feelings. Getting less sleep also um, contributes to their physical development. So sleep empowers the immune system helps regulate hormones and enables muscle and tissue recovery. So if your um, children are getting between that eight to 10 hours a night, playing sports, physical activity, everything else, it's just gonna help them recover better overnight. Adolescents who fail to get enough sleep um, can have a troubling metabolic profile, which either means their metabolism may be um, too high or too low meaning that they're at higher risk for diabetes or long-term cardiovascular problems. So the more that we are able to regulate their sleep patterns, the better overall um, their physical development may be. Getting enough sleep also contributes to teenagers' decision-making, which is a huge factor. Um, as we know, teenagers can be impulsive, make risky decisions, participate in risky behavior. Um, this all affects the development of the frontal lobe. And like Laura touched on, um, our brains are not finished forming until about the age of 25. So when a teenager or your child makes an, a decision that seems like this wasn't thought through, um, what were you thinking? Why did you do that? Sometimes their answer is, I don't know, because they really don't know. Their frontal lobe hasn't been fully developed yet, and they have a hard time with that decision making outweighing the risks and the benefits. So the frontal lobe is critical to controlling their impulsive behavior. I think we can all think back to a time of when we were a teenager and we probably made a mistake and there really wasn't a reason why, why we did it. We just did it. Teens who don't get enough sleep are more likely to participate in these high risk behaviors. So the less sleep that they're getting, the lower their impulse control is. So some of these risky behaviors that we see are you know, drug driving, texting and driving, failing to use seatbelt, not wearing a helmet when they're driving a motorcycle and riding their bike. In addition to these risky behaviors, we also see you know, drug and alcohol use, smoking. So the impulse control of you know, bringing their vape to school or experimenting with these things with their friends. They don't have that frontal lobe fully formed yet to make these decisions. 
Um, this also can be like risky sexual behavior, fighting at school, even carrying a weapon with them. So why do teens get such little sleep? This is due to many contributing factors that sometimes are control. So the best thing that we can do is support our children. So having a delayed sleep schedule and school start times. In middle school, high school, children aren't really getting tired until about 11 p.m. due to their internal biological clock. So that makes it difficult when they have an early school start time, like as a baby factor that's out of our control. If school starts at 7.25 in the morning and your child has to get up at 6 a.m. to get ready, um, make a bus sign, that's not really something you can um, do something about. But there's also all the added time pressure on children, like Laura touched on. Usually when they're done with school, they either have sports, um, other that they have to finish up and participate in, clubs, activities. They want to hang out with their friends. They have to come home and spend time with their family, have dinner. All of these things that add all this time pressure on them. Like we experience too, like there are not enough hours in the day for us to accomplish all of these things. In addition to that, the use of electronic devices plays a major role in why teenagers are not getting enough sleep. Most children that I work with, you know, use their phone for about an hour before bed. They're scrolling on TikTok, Instagram, Snapchatting with their friends or FaceTiming, which all can be positive behaviors, but in a different way. So not using these devices before bedtime. A lot of children like to fall asleep with the TV on or they're playing video games on like, you know, their Xbox or their Nintendo Switch. These are all activities that stimulate the brain instead of allowing your child to slow down before bed and get into that restful state of being able to fall asleep. A lot of children do with anxiety and depressive symptoms can have sleep disorders as well. So if your child struggles with anxiety and they have these racing thoughts and are worried about what's um, coming the next day at school, things that they didn't have time to finish and what these consequences are going to be for them, the harder time they're going to have being able to fall asleep and also stay asleep throughout the night. An important thing that I wanted to touch on is the circadian rhythm of sleep wake cycle. So this has been also something that's been studied very in depth for years about why teenagers have such a hard time falling asleep. With the circadian rhythm um, teenager cycle, as we can see, about 11 down, and that's really when naturally teenagers are going to start getting sleepy. The body is a natural amount of melatonin, which is the sleep hormone, and this happens about an hour later than most adults. So parents may be getting ready for bed 9 to p.m. They're sleepy and wondering why is my child still wide This is because for most teenagers this doesn't happen until about 11 o'clock. The blue light from these tech, uh, the technology devices that we use um, actually suppresses melatonin and disrupts sleep cycle. So the more blue light that a child is using before they go to bed actually suppresses the amount of melatonin that they're getting, further increasing that effect of staying up later and later. Um, the big dip is what we like to call it, is when the teenager's energy is at its lowest. So depending on your internal clock, you might not fully feel awake until about 9, 10 a.m. So like we said, teenagers wake up 6 a.m. for school. So when they're struggling to get out of bed in the morning and get ready for school, brushing their teeth, a lot of teenagers skip breakfast because they're not fully awake yet and they don't feel like eating. These are all factors that are contributing to why they're not even really fully awake yet. When their classes start at 7.25 in the morning and you know they're struggling to keep their head up and they're yawning, this is where these factors come into play. So from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. is really when teenagers are getting that full four-hour cycle of the sleep that they need, and that's when the circadian rhythm kicks in. For teenagers, their energy really boosts from about 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. So this is good, right? This is, you know, a three-hour chunk of when they're in school, and this is when they feel the best. So this is when their body temperature is rising throughout the morning, their alertness and their attention span increases, their thinking is sharper. So this benefits them to happen um, in the middle of the school day. About two to 5 p.m. as school is ending and these teenagers are getting home, they feel very sluggish. Um, they might need a snack to boost their um, energy levels. And when we're adults, like we probably all know from about one to three is when we get like that after lunch slump when we're at work, we feel like we might need a coffee or we need to, you know, go for a walk, wake ourselves up. This happens from about 2 to 5 p.m. for teenagers. So as you can see, this cycle is really, really important to making sure that they're getting in bed earlier time and establishing these habits that are going to allow them to get more sleep. So like I said, teenagers naturally get tired until 11 p.m. If we want them to be able to get that 8 to 10 hours a night, sometimes the bedtime routine needs to be a little bit earlier in the day. Even if you fight, establishing these little structure of like a good bedtime routine is really what's going to show the most um, results. 
So what can we do to help our teenagers get better sleep? So sleep hygiene. This is something that I also wanted to touch on is um, hygiene, not as in like cleanliness, but this includes their sleep environment habits. So being able to budget eight hours of sleep into your daily schedule and keeping that same schedule on both weekdays and weekends. I know this sounds difficult. A lot of teenagers like to stay up late with their friends on the weekends and sleep in. But the more we try to get them at least getting that eight to 10 hours on the weekends as well, the better the results are going to be. This also can include creating a consistent pre-bedtime routine that helps with relaxation and being able to fall asleep faster. A lot of teenagers that I work with say, you know, I lay in bed for, um, on my phone for about an hour. I put my phone down, actually trying to go to sleep, and then they lay there staying, staring at the ceiling because they feel wired and wide awake after using their technology. This is linking back to lowering the melatonin in the brain that's being released. Um, when teenagers are able to avoid caffeine and energy drinks, especially in the afternoon and the evenings, this is crucial because a lot of times we know that caffeine can be prolonged throughout the night. And this is another reason that they're not able to go to bed until one, two in the morning. Putting away electronic devices for at least 30 minutes before bed and keeping them on silent to avoid them checking it at night. So a lot of phones have the do not disturb option, which can be great. So when they're going to bed and they're really trying to get that sleep, but their phone continues to go off in the middle of the night or their, their friends FaceTiming them or they're getting Snapchats and they hear that buzzing, they're gonna wake up and wanna check that notification. With a lot of children, the notification going off provides an instant feeling of like serotonin and happiness from seeing what the friend wants to send them and they wake up and they can go back. So being able to limit that for at least 30 minutes before bedtime is crucial. Getting your children up in a room where they feel comfortable, safe, home is very important. So we all want to have the bar, coffee bed, pillows, and blankets, being able to have a setting where your teenager really does feel comfortable enough to fall asleep and rest throughout night. So maybe even asking them, you know, I know you're struggling to fall asleep. Is there something that I miss? You know, in your room, do you want a fuzzy blanket? Do you want some black ones? Asking them what they think is going to help them as well. So with that being said, having the consistent pre-bedtime routine is one of the most important things that we can establish. So it's not going to work instantly, but over time, if you continue to do the same things with your teenager before bed, as the weeks pass, you will see a, a, like a consistent outcome and your teenager will start to feel better too. The more sleep they're getting, the better they're going to feel and really the more motivated they're going to be to be active throughout the day. And then when they know it's time to go to bed, it's time to go to bed. So a consistent pre-bedtime routine, for example, for a teenager could be, you know, they eat dinner with you, they finish up whatever homework they may need to finish for the upcoming school day, and then you two can de decide together what works best for them. So that may be taking their shower at night, getting out of the shower, allowing them to have that screen time to watch their TV show or talk with their friends on the phone or play their video games, but then agreeing, you know, when it's 10, 1030, this is the appropriate time for you to be putting your stuff away. And I want you to be able to get that rest. So when you wake up in the morning, you're ready for the day. And like I said, this isn't something that happens overnight, but as the weeks pass, you will see, you know, consistent change. I like to, um, I wanted to include this too, the 10 sleep tips for teens. So a huge one too, is only using your bed when it's bedtime. So I know for myself too, maybe I had a long day at work. I like to go home and maybe sit in my bed for an hour. This actually does the opposite effect for relaxation because it trains your brain that when you're in bed, maybe you're not going to sleep right away. If you're only using your bed for bedtime when you're laying down to go to sleep, that trains your brain into knowing that, okay, it's time for me to go to bed. So a lot of times when teenagers like to sit in bed and scroll on their phone, not at night, it's training their brain that it's not time to go to sleep. If teenagers are able to try to go to bed at the same time every day, this is going to further establish a structure routine for them. Limiting that caffeine consumption. So really trying to limit the energy drinks and coffee after about 2 p.m. Eating also has a major factor into this. So eating at least two hours before bed. So having that consistent time for teenagers is crucial. If they want to have a bedtime, bedtime snack, limit it, limit it to something that's more sugar. Also very important, having a relaxing pre bedtime routine to clear your thoughts. A lot of teenagers that I work with have been getting into meditation. So having you know, five, 10 minutes to themselves to just close their eyes, think about their day and what they want to prepare for in the next day. Having those calm, clear thoughts. Also, what I found to work really well is um, teenagers like to have sound machines in their room or have sounds playing on their phone. 
So not using their phone, but opening their phone to rain sounds or storm sounds or white noise as they're beginning to fall asleep can really be helpful. I also know a lot of teenagers like to fall asleep with a fan on. So having these background noises can be really beneficial for them to be able to fall asleep. Like I said, too, having that structured like shower time when they take a shower that can allow them to relax before they go to bed, feel comfy and want to crawl into those covers and fall asleep. Tea can also be very beneficial. There's a lot of teas that I like are that like to drink um, sleepy time tea. This is a tea that you can find at any grocery store and has you know natural herbs in it that allow you to relax in your body and your brain to be able to go to bed. Um, like I said too, just making sure that you're in a place that's comfortable for them to fall asleep, making sure that your bedroom is not too hot. I don't know many people that like to sleep in a hot bedroom. Um, so making sure that temperature is maybe a little bit lower for them. And then my last point, turning off your computer. A lot of our teenagers, you know, their uh, schools provide them computers to do their homework on. Like I said, being able to limit that blue light time is crucial to allow their brains to unwind and be able to go to bed. So if you know that your teenager has an assignment that's coming up or they're studying for a test the next day and they have to be using their school computer, maybe try and encourage them to do that when they get home from school rather than later in the day when, before they're going to bed. So with all that being said, there are so many factors that go into why teenagers have such a thing, um, you know, eight to nine hours a night, what we can do to help all of these different factors that play that sleep effects. So the emotional level, the decision-making, the physical development, all of these play such a crucial factor in how teens' um, amount of sleep affects their mental health. Thank you, Marley. Um, I just have one question. Um, the question is, when you're talking about uh, out of sleep mm -hmm. that the um, children need, does it differ from boy to girl? That's a good question. Um, yes, actually, it does differ for boys and girls. Like Laura brought up, you know, teenagers going through puberty. Girls actually have been shown that they need more sleep than boys. Um, this also has to do with girls hitting puberty at a younger age. So requiring them, you know, their bodies when they're going through those physical changes, the more sleep they get, the better it is for them. So thank you for bringing that up. Yes, it's been shown that girls do require more sleep than boys. Thank you. I appreciate um, your answer. Well, does anyone else have any uh, additional questions to ask? If you do, please unmute yourself. Anita, I did. Um, hello, Marley. My name is Sharita Johnson. Hi, Sharita. And, um, I'm sitting in. Um, I'm a CMU student, so I'm just observing. But I had a question. You had stated that <clears throat> children need the same amount of sleep on the weekends that they need during the week. Um, if parents allow students um to stay up um a few additional hours do you do you suggest that they get um they get the additional amount of sleep required to um keep them kind of stable yes that's a good question um thank you and fire up chips by the way i went to central michigan for my undergrad <laughs> okay so for teenagers like you said if you're letting them stay up you know maybe 1 2 a.m with their friends on the weekends allowing them to still get that eight to 10 hour chunk is crucial. So like you said, keeping it stable. So if they're going to bed at 2 a.m., if you allow them to sleep to 10 a.m. to noon, that's still allowing them to get that eight to 10 hour chunk. So yes, yeah, just keeping it, trying to keep those hours as stable as possible. Okay, I have one more question. Um, you um, you alluded to, I think that was the last item you said in the computer. Um, if children are allowed to play games, if they're not allowed to play games, what effects do you think that the um, video game have behavior? Um, it's like sleeping and their fashion. Good question. Yeah, so video game play on behavior is also as well, you know, mostly bad. So playing video games is perfectly fine for children, you know, they're on the end and things like that. Like I said, the the big thing is for us, but the blue thing that we experience before the time they're playing is a lot of stuff. Like that's when it's crucial to try and shut that video game down about an hour before bedtime. I know for a lot of um, students I work with, especially boys, one of their favorite things to do with their friends and socialize is play video games with each other. So, you know, you're, they're not even sitting next to each other in the same house. They're using their headsets to talk to each other while they're playing video games. So it definitely can be a positive way for them to socialize with their friends. And like Laura just brought up too, if they are playing video games, blue light glasses are Awesome. I'm wearing a pair of blue light glasses right now that significantly limit the amount of blue light that their eyes are experiencing before bedtime. Thank you. Any other questions or concerns or just comments? <laughs>